250 podcast, webcast, whatever you want to call it, discussing random topics here and there. Let's get to it. All right, so um, let me share the screen here. I always screw this up somehow. Uh, all right, so uh, again, I'm not, I'm not doing it like um, straight up. First aid, but yeah, it's pretty much just uh, uh, it's pretty much just um, a bunch of different uh, topics from, and I combined some cap things. So, you guys see my desktop now? Okay, uh, let me do this then. Oh no, copyright. What is that book? I've never seen it before. Okay. Alright. Okay, so in today's episode, we're going to look at the bug MAI, the drug MAI treatment, and then the concept will be sarcoidosis. So, mycobacterium avium intracellulare. So, this is a bacteria similar to TB, which causes disseminated non-TB type diseases in AIDS and immunocomp patients, and it is often drug resistant. Uh, so it presents uh, similar to TB in the sense that you get persistent cough, fever, weight loss, but one thing that is slightly different from TB is that you get GI symptoms associated with it, diarrhea, constipation. Uh, and so obviously with those, goes along with the weight loss, you're going to have um, a, um, malnutrition after a while with this. So um, the, the persistent cough and hemoptysis are really the first ones. You don't typically get the chills with this uh, as frequently as you do with TV. So my question to you guys is, when do we prophylax with azithromycin? Max. So you need four count less than fifty. Right. C so four count less than fifty. And then similar to TB, which we do ripe therapy, we have rifampin and ethambutol from the ripe therapy, as well as azithromycin. So, and I didn't know this until step two stuff came around because we only talk about prophylaxis but uh, it, in the practice that I'm rotating at right now they get a lot of MAI actually because these patients are a lot of them are immunocomp so uh, this is what they get and so you got to do triple treatment with them for six months who's, who's ruffling up papers like crazy sorry I'm <laughs> All right, your shit. <laughs> um, okay, so continuing on with uh, this, we're just going to go over these individual drugs just to switch it up from everybody always studying the right therapy. Um, okay, so mechanisms for ethambutol. You guys remember that one? know the ADRs for ethambutol right off the bat. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, um, it's disgusting. It affects the DNA. Uh, but what are the ADRs of ethambutol? So the green green eye pigmentation. Yeah. Right. Eye ethambutol. Yeah. So you can get color blindness and actually you can get what's called retrobulbar neuritis so you can lose your vision in general as well and um uh you you need to have them since they're on these drugs you know for uh either tb or mai you want them to be followed by an ophthalmologist to make sure that they're not getting any kind of um regularities in their eyes so um uh 
the, the mechanism is actually it inhibits the synthesis of arabinogalactan, which is a cell wall component. So, whatever, just knowing that it's a cell wall inhibitor, is it good enough? How about rifampin? Let's go with the mechanism. <clears throat> DNA dependent RNA polymerase. Right. How about azithromycin? It's a macrolide, remember? The DS subunit? Nice. It inhibits translocation from the acceptor to the donor site. So if you remember, uh, I, I always like using the, the little photo in um, uh, Kaplan's pharmacology book on page 184 and the whatever, this is the 2016 lecture notes. It's just they're moving from um, <coughs> excuse me, from the uh, the P site to the A site. Uh, it's essentially um, macrolides inhibit. Okay, so we talked about the ADRs for ethambutol or ithambutol. It's got the visual acuity problems and the uh, color blindness associated. What about the ADRs of rifampin? It's hepatotoxic. What's that? It's hepatotoxic. Good. Does this add on chrome P450? Is it an inhibitor or an inducer? Inducer. Inducer, nice. And, and then you get the orange blood, orange blood body fluids, so just tears, sweat. Yeah. I know that's okay. a commonly asked question. And what's the other fluid? The fluid that we urine. get rid of urine. most every day. Your <laughs> urine, yeah. Urine. You're gonna have orange or pink or red urine. Um, about azithromycin, I actually forgot about some of these uh, adverse drug reactions when I was looking this up. So some of it's the macro, right? So GI yeah. motility issue. That's right. It, it um it stimulates motilin receptors. So you'll have yeah. Um, QT interval is prolonged, right? Nice. And there's also one more. C diff colitis. Right. What, what did you say? C. diff colitis? Um, well, yeah, it, it, any, any, um, anything can cause rash, anything can cause C. diff, any, uh, sorry, I'll say that again. any antibiotics can cause rash, any antibiotics can cause <coughs> C. diff, but I'll give you a clue, if you mix a MAC with an aminoglycoside, it could, um, it could... Uh, accentuate this particular Does it have liver so it can cause deafness at high doses mm, okay. I forgot about that one. Auto yeah. so um, so with the other max you know we have uh, a erythromycin, clorithromycin, and azithromycin. And as far as the GI-associated uh, symptoms go, erythromycin has the greatest amount of the GI symptoms, and azithro has the least. So that's why you give z packs and patients tend to tolerate that much better than uh, erythromycin, because you give that to, if you and I took it because, you know, we had um, sinusitis or whatever, and um, uh, we took it, we would be, you know, crapping our guts out, possibly vomiting, nausea. Um, so what type of patient might we want to give erythromycin to? If they have these GI symptoms, what kind of patient would be a good candidate for this drug? Not immunocompromised. Okay. Um, again, I'm talking about the, the GI stuff. Someone that's uh, constipated. Okay, constipated. Uh, I, I'm looking for a, a patient that has an infection and also has diabetic gastroparesis. 
because the this will help stimulate their GI system. So yeah, I'm sure some with diabetic gastroparesis it is going to be constipated, but um, if someone's just generally constipated, you probably want to give them, you know, Ducolax or some kind of stool softener first before you go straight to something that's going to make them crap like crazy. Aren't uh, erythromycin and chlorithromycin inhibitors for cytochrome P450? Yes. Well, all, all, all three of them are. Oh, okay. Cool. Um, and again, I'm pretty sure Mm-hmm. Actually, I don't want to. I want to say something incorrectly. I know also that the the degree of their uh, inhibition of P450 the same way as the GI is, motility, correct? Is is it that E has the most and A has the least? That's. I think that's how I remember it. But double check. Yeah, I'm trying to find. Uh, Smoking and drinking and Barb's car will refrigerate her phenytoin and that's the coke. on page 243 of pharmacology first aid says erythromycin is the biggest inhibitor yes which um, what's that which one's the biggest inhibitor well it just has erythromycin and then in parentheses has macrolide so i'm assuming that it would follow similar pattern right erythromycin being greater of an inhibitor than azithromycin yeah okay you're right e Erythromycin has the most P450 interactions, and azithro has the least, right? Which I guess makes sense, because azithro is the one that we uh, oh, um, are least worried about when we give to patients, so. All right. Any questions on these three drugs? What's the mechanism of resistance for azithromycin or macrolides in general? RNA methylation. Yeah, which what subunit? Uh, so it's the methylation of the 23S <clears throat> RNA binding site that prevents the binding of the drug because the mechanism is it binds to the 23 RNA subunit of the 50S subunit. Mm. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I see it here now. Damn. Nice. And I don't know if bacteriostatic versus bactericidal is an important aspect to know as far as uh, step one is concerned or even, you know, later on in clinical. So, Pete, if you have any regarding the bacteriostatic versus bactericidal. Uh, honestly, uh, for step one, uh, the only thing I always remembered was that uh, aminoglycosides and linezolid were the only cell wall drugs that um, that were cytal, and everything else is static. Okay. So these are going to, azithromycin is going to be a static. Okay. And, no, as far as like using the, these drugs clinically, dude, what's after step one? People are like, dude, who gives a shit about the mechanisms? All you should really know is average drug reactions, and what do they cover? Well, that's that's kind of what everybody says you have to remember. Just like, hey, uh, macrolides co- cover gram-positive cocci, and then the irregular drugs like Legionella and MAI and... Um, and, and exactly. exactly. <clears throat> um, and it says here H. pylori and Campy, so that too okay um all right so sarcoid and uh holy crap there are a lot of sarcoid patients out there because 
It is an immune-mediated systemic disease associated with restrictive lung disease, erythema nodosum, lupus perineum, Bell's palsy, uveitis, and a bunch of other things. But the the, the presentation of the patient is going to be uh, restrictive lung disease. So they're going to come in with shortness of breath, and maybe they'll have some kind of skin manifestation, and you're going to have to start ruling things out. Uh, from there, because you're going to think, ah, maybe this one, someone has asthma, but then you got to start looking deeper into uh, once, you know, uh, they don't have the normal asthma signs or they don't have, like, eosinophil or IgE counts that are high, then you have to start wondering other things. So what are some of the characteristics of a sarcoid? Lab values or the type of patient or... You gotta get non-caseating granuloma formation. Right, and that is actually a requirement for uh, diagnosis. You have to prove non-caseating granulomas. What else we got? What about some lab values that are irregular? Your CD4 and CD8 counts are gonna be high. Right, you know, a little more specific than that. Your um, ACE levels are going to be high. ACE, ACE is going to be high, right? There's another electrolyte that will be elevated. Calcium? Yes, hypercalcium. We'll talk about that a little bit. And... They are typically seen in black females. Um, so um, it's, Yash, you're right that they would be elevated, but it's also the CD4 over CD8 ratio. Oh, sure. okay. Yeah, so, um, well, yeah, so I'm sure they would be elevated, but this is like the specific elevation that is a bit more um, specific to this one. Okay, so. Yeah, whatever, copyright, we're not, we're monetizing this, so let's just, so, <coughs> well, okay, so maybe someone can help me out, but I'm having some difficulty with my, my pen, it won't do screenshots, oh, wow, now you do it, thanks a lot, pen, wow, <laughs> dude, I was working on this for like, no, anyway, so, uh, so this is the non-caseating grain, so the first shot is the non-caseating granuloma that we see there. And then um, second, which is very typical of um, sarcoid, is that you're going to have bilateral reticular opacities. And they're going to be um, very obvious at the hilar areas. So, okay, I can use this here. The hilar areas. So, again, the hilum, those are like the, the branches or the stalks of your uh, uh, your main stem bronchi. And then here, when you can see on the CT that there's going to be a lot of uh, uh, hilar and mediastinal um, association here. So on top of needing to have the uh, caseating granulomas, but non-caseating granulomas, you also have to have a chest x-ray, and you got to see that hilar lymphadenopathy to help with um, that. So this is something that my doc pimped us out on in front of a patient. What is lupus pernio? And I got it wrong. It looked like a doofus. So. Something that looks uh, like lupus? Yeah. What's that? Something that looks like lupus. I think it's like uh, skin lesions that look like lupus. Right, it's skin lesions and it has nothing to do with lupus. It's just a really shitty name to designed to fuck with us, but it is the skin lesions. And like you said, it can be in a lupus like distribution, but it can't have just about anywhere. But so these are the, the raised purplish lesions. And um, they typically will happen on the nose. And, um, so is it and like course, a butterfly? Butterfly rash? Uh, I haven't seen the butterfly characteristic of it. See, this is why it's, it's, uh, a, it, 
where it got the name. It got the name because, you know, they're probably, you know, whatever person was uh, looking at it originally probably thought it was lupus, but this is, um, it becomes indurated and it presents a lot of times on the nose and actually the patient that he's pimping us on has a nasal septal deformity because of the lupus pernio to the point where her tissue has degraded and she has saddle nose deformity at this point. And she went to see a plastic surgeon and even she, it, it, they were like, we can't, we can't put anything here because you have no structure. So she has this, uh, it's unfortunate, just this, um, the skin manifestation and uh but it's not it's not just on the face this is what he was stressing to us and actually the patient didn't even want to talk about it he talked to us afterwards she was like oh i have some on my back and on my arms and on my nose and after she left he was like what she didn't want to talk about was the fact that the areas that she has the skin manifestations the worst is in her genital area and she's like a 40 year old woman, you know, she's a, a normal, she's not, you know, a disgusting person. She's a normal looking person. And she apparently has severe manifestations down there. And, uh, you know, it's, it, she's depressed because of it, you know, because that affects your personal life. You know, if you want to go on a date, you got to explain to whoever, like, hey, something, something's not right there. Just giving you the heads up. That's going to, affect your, your your way to have a relationship so something to keep in mind so um what i wanted to talk about was and uh i i, I didn't include this in the slides again because i was kind of pressed for time today um but what is the mechanism of the elevated calcium levels mm. Because you have so much macrophages, is that <clears throat> helping convert? Right. So the macrophages, um, it, it, okay, because wh where are the macrophages? Why are there so many macrophages? Well, because you're secreting INF gamma. So, so it, because all these non caseating granulomas... They have all these macrophages that are forming these granulomas. And yeah, so the, the macrophages become little calcium factories because they have increased one alpha yeah, right now, hydroxylates. Uh, vitamin B, vitamin D. Vitamin D, right. They have the increased one alpha hydroxylase. Hydroxylase, <clears throat> which turns them into calcium factories, like you said, because they're going to have high levels of vitamin D, which will, um, yeah, so leads to hypercalcemia. Um, so, um, one note that I have here in my first aid stuff is that uh, if they do give you lab values, you will typically see a low PTH. And that's because it, uh, it's going to be secondary to the high calcium levels. So super high calcium levels, but low PTH. And you're going to be like, hmm, there's got to be a different reason for this calcium to be uh, manifesting. So treatment is normally steroids. But, uh, and actually we just had a drug rep come in. On something called Axar, which is the new drug. It costs 10 thousand dollars per shot and you have to get it twice a week twice and a week 10 grand <clears throat> shot insurance pays for it but you have to prove that you actually need it so you have to it has to be refractory to steroid use but this uh Akthar is ACTH and so it if you guys remember from uh that big chart for GFR, you know, Mariulosa, um, uh, particular uh, and fasicular. Thank you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Those things. So ACTH is what starts that entire cascade. And eventually you will create, um, cortisol. So it's kind of like a, a different way 
to activate steroids without having as many steroidal side effects, but it, you can still have steroid type side effects with this one. So this is the new uh, kind of uh, um, sarcoid treatment for it. And there's another one that came out, but literally the, my, my preceptor just learned about it today, so I got nothing for you on it. So he was super excited because he's like, I just want to... I want them to train me so I can do talks on it and get paid. All right. Cool. All right. Um, so you guys got any questions about it? So, again, the restrictive lung disease is the big one because, uh, because that's how the patient will present breathing problems and some, uh, some skin manifestations, very typically. Okay. So I got a quick quiz for us. 54 year old male comes to the doc because of chronic cough and bloody sputum. He smokes two packs a day for 20 years and only recently quit. He has been experiencing weight loss, anorexia, constipation, increased fatigue. On exam, he is cachectic and pale. Lab studies are as follows sodium 1.4, or potassium 4.3. Chloride 98, bicarb 21, calcium 12.9, BU 128, 8.8. Chest x ray demonstrates a hilar mass on the left. Oh, that's supposed to be left lung. And biopsy of this mass would likely demonstrate what? We've got TB, squamous cell carcinoma of the lung, small cell carcinoma of the lung, sarcoidosis, or adenocarcinoma of the lung. Sarcoid. Are you sure? Mm -hmm. Elevated calcium level, and then higher mass. I will tell you this right now. I'm being an asshole. <laughs> it is kind not of figured. Kind of figured. So let's discuss why it isn't sarcoid. First off, we've got a male. And yes, sarcoid can happen in males, but we're talking step one. They're probably going to stick to African-American female. So that one's not so good. Yeah, we've got the calcium. Yeah. Uh, but there's something else that could cause calcium elevation that we'll get into in a minute. And the problem is... In the left lung, it should be in both sides, right? Right. It's normally bilateral. Bilateral. Oh, I don't even have it there. But yes, it's normally bilateral. So, but this guy still has weight loss, anorexia. He's got a cancer. He's got a cancer. So, remember perineoplastic symptoms? Mm -hmm. Syndromes? So, which of these... Which of these causes parathyroid hormone related peptide? That's the money maker. It's not adenocarcinoma. Small cell? No. Small cell. It's screaming. So, I, I know we've talked about this before. If there's anything for you to remember, a perineoplastic squamous cell does P, T, H, R, P, and this one does all the other ones. So if there's anything that you need to remember from that, because you can always get confused with, ah, is it this one or that one? Squamous cell only does that one, and then small cell does all the other ones, the ACTH, the SIADH, um, whatever the heck the other one is. Um, no, there's something else. Ah, Lambert, Lambert Eaton. Lambert Eaton. That's the calcium. That's where the calcium portion. Yeah, calcium channel blockers. No, yo, presynaptic calcium channels, right? So, um, so yeah, that was a dick question on my part, but. <laughs> The question that got me. Okay, so, um, okay, 
So I just learned this today. And uh, so this is a, a phrase that my, my preceptor always says, if you want to keep this. Um, if there's something that isn't too important to remember, like let's say um, something like uh, viral replication, that's something – for the floppy disk you remember for the test and as soon as it's done get rid of it you don't need that but if it's something that you need to know for life you put it in the hard drive long-term storage so what we learned today was what is the difference between a mass and a node and Let's start with a node on an X-ray is less than three centimeters, whereas a mass is greater than three centimeters in size. And that is literally the, the diagnostic difference, just so that they have a clear-cut definition for uh, how to – this is how you grade a tumor. This, I think, if, he's, if I remember correctly, this would staging at a T1, and this would pop it up to a T2 tumor. So he told us this, and he said, put that in the hard drive. <coughs> okay. And uh, that's all I got for you guys today.